offer MSc and MPhil PhD programs, our core business is research, and our current research agenda is Caribbean Prospects for 2030 and the Global Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, or simply Caribbean Prospects. This seminar helps us to look at SDG 16, which seeks to promote peace, justice, and strong institutions. Honorable Colonel Charles Jr., Minister of State in the Ministry of National Security, please join me in welcoming him to the podium. And good, is it good evening or good afternoon? Which one? Good afternoon, still. Of course, special greetings to all of the distinguished members of the head table. Um, I would like, before I start, just to make it very clear that I truly appreciate the opportunity for us to have this discussion. I know that it is possibly not one that most persons in government or while in government would want to embark on, but it is very important for have, to have these discussions, and it's important for us to not just let our discussions stop here, but hopefully we can continue to debate issues peacefully and in a manner that allows us to ventilate all of the various considerations. Today happens to be my son's birthday. He's one years old today. So when you hear me say that I have to leave, it is in no way that I want to leave. But you would appreciate that there is no way I will be able to stay here and get away with going home at a late time. So if you see me running out, it is no disrespect to you or to the topic, um, certainly not to my fellow keynote speaker, um, but it is because I have no other choice but to leave. So I crave your indulgence before I do leave. Now, I have set up a very short PowerPoint to make the discussion easier. And um, I'll go to the, this is the first one. Now, I found it interesting when I was reading the title of the discussion. So listen to how we have framed the discussion in Jamaica rejecting the prison deal. That is how, this, how Jamaica has been discussing this issue. First and foremost, what I hope we can do as we engage in this discussion is refocus exactly what are we supposed to be contemplating for our people? What is the real essence of this debate, this discussion? Is it that we should be discussing the fact that we have rejected anything or discussing what it really is to see the benefits of it? Is it good? Is it bad? Also, we no longer have prisons in Jamaica. As you know, what we call them is correctional institutions. And that is because we are moving away from that whole concept of the prison to a place we are looking towards rehabilitation and redemption. And what we are defining as a deal, first and foremost, for anybody entering into a debate um, that is opposed to it, you are put on your back foot because immediately it is being seen as a deal which is connoting something that must be good. So why are you rejecting it? I can't sit here and say they're wrong. What I can say is that for this administration, our policy priorities, the strategic priorities, our perspective has shifted. It's a different perspective. And so within the context of this administration, the offer, the terms and conditions, the concept, the notion of the offer that was put on the table is not one that falls in line with the rationalization of our institutions, with the reduction of population within the institutions. It is not one that falls in line with our priority shift towards prevention as opposed to incarceration. And again, I don't want to say that, ever saying that, well, the administration before didn't care about rehabilitation. That's rubbish. They saw it as an integral part of moving forward. And if you read anything that has been 
put forward by Mr. Bunting or anybody else, any minister in the past, it has always been identified as a critical element. But of course, with changing administrations, you have changing priorities. And within our policy perspective, moving towards an expansion of the prison population was not aligned with our priorities. The historical context, um, I know that there are members of this panel that can much better than I dive into the historical context, so I won't stay too long on that. But I will say that as a leader, as a politician particularly, because we are all leaders, whether it is professors, engineers, politicians, but particularly as a politician, um, the social context, the thinking, the psychology of your people must be a consideration in your decisions. And I think that the entire discussion around this partnership that we have with the United Kingdom, one of our strongest partners, um, and the evolution of the Jamaican people, where we are coming from, from slavery to where we are today, where some say that we are still at least mentally um, enslaved. It is something that we have to consider, the notion of seeing people as a, almost a commodity um, to be shifted here and there because of interest and preference. It's something which we have to think about when we're discussing these issues. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that to other members of the panel to dive into. Um, let's go to the next slide. So, the terms and conditions of this memorandum of understanding of which we are discussing, I'm certain former Minister of National Security can dive into the specifics of it, but in general terms, we all understand that there was an offer made to Jamaica for us to consider the transfer of prisoners from the United Kingdom to our jurisdiction, and in doing so, um, to be enticed, I'll say, you know, uh, by the assistance with the construction of a facility that could hold those persons that would be transferred to Jamaica, as well as some of our inmates. And so we'd be able to have one big facility lovely purposeful built facility which would be able to hold everybody and could immediately deal with all the issues we've had of overcrowding and deplorable conditions at tower street and st catherine correctional and everywhere else and so that's the general understanding um let me say this the administration today has as our priority and within our issues relating to the Department of Correctional Services has acknowledged first and foremost that we have conditions that for too long have existed that can only be defined as deplorable within some of our institutions. I have toured the institutions and I would never stand here to defend the state of the institutions. I think that they certainly need um, some adjustment. And so we have moved towards adjusting the state of our institutions. And in doing so, we have made some commitments. We've made commitments not only to look on it as an infrastructural issue, but a very comprehensive issue as to why is it that we would want this facility in the first place. You will hear that the reason why we want this facility is because the facility will allow us to have much better rehabilitation activities. That's the number one thing that you will hear. And it is true. If we had a new facility, we would be able to have the opportunity to build it out and to create spaces, and it would be much more effective, I can say, for rehabilitation. But does it mean that we can't, within our context and within our budget and within the reality of our country, do that in today's Jamaica? 
And we are committed to doing that. And I'll show you later on how we are doing so. And in addition to doing that, the focus on prevention um, has led us to initiate a number of activities that are all geared towards improving youth development. And that is because, again, with a focus on reducing the amount of persons that are incarcerated, you have to look on it by identifying and anal analyzing where they are coming from. So the matter of expansion of non-custodial sentences. And within that context, I'll also speak about issues like elect electronic monitoring. The reasons why this administration has spoken of those alternatives is because they also will contribute to our ability to move persons out of the facilities. Remember, our focus, our priority, our goal is not to have more, but to have less. And not to have less in the context where we're putting violent criminals on the street, no. But where we are able to rehabilitate our citizens in such a way that they will not have any compulsion to be reoffenders or to be reintegrated back into the, to the facility. Improving the infrastructure of the correctional facilities. This is another one of the things that we are committed to. And let me state this clearly. One of the fallacies in this discussion is that if you, if you agree that this deal, which is an offer, is good, it means you agree that we need new facilities. If you disagree, it means you don't think we need new facilities. Let me dispel that notion. That's not true. This simplistic, one-dimensional way of looking on these matters is what has held us back as a country for so long. There's so many different variables that you have to look on. And so we have taken steps to improve the facilities. Steps were being taken before to improve the facilities. When I became Minister of State with responsibility for the correctional um, services, we inherited from Mr. Bunting the initiative of building out the 308-man facility at Tamarin Farm. That is something which we have continued, and we are improving on it. We are now building an administrative block to facilitate um, the occupation of, of that 300-man facility, and we're building a modern sewage facility, treatment facility, on Tambin Farm, as well as expanding the agricultural program there. You'd have heard of the greenhouse technology that we introduced to Tambin Farm just this month or last month. Added to that, I must tell you, as a matter of improving the facilities, we have abandoned one of the school areas that was less uh, than accommodating, and we are now building a new learning facility on Tamarind Farm. So, again, let's dispel the notion that any administration that doesn't grab the millions of pounds that are coming to us to accept prisoners from another jurisdiction is an administration that doesn't believe in building facilities or doesn't want facilities. No. We understand that facilities are needed and they have to be purpose-built in such a way to enhance rehabilitation. And we have been doing that. And I can show you how we've been doing that successfully. And the numbers speak for itself as well. Because we, in driving the process of reducing the numbers within the um, institutions and increasing the rehabilitation activities, can show you that we have much more effective rehabilitation and our numbers are going down. Right now, let me tell you this. Again, if you ask any average Jamaican, if you asked me one year ago, Tell me the state of the correctional institutions in Jamaica, the prisons as we call it. I'd say they're overburdened and it's rotten. And I used to go there. Because I used to go there as an attorney to take statements when I was in law school. But that's false. It's another fallacy. We have 11 institutions and only two have more than the ideal capacity. Nine are almost 60% and under. Of the four juvenile institutions, 
we are only 50% and under of all. If we put two of them together, it still cannot reach the ideal capacity. So understand that we have to start talking about these things and communicating to our people so we get it right, so we understand that what we really need to be doing in Jamaica, instead of stretching ourselves to a place which would be great if we had it, but stretching us, ourselves to a place where we would have to maintain facilities at a cost that would be unjustifiable in the context of all of the things taking place in Jamaica now. We are better off managing our facilities in such a way that we achieve the same goal, maybe not as perfect as it could be if we had all of the money, but we achieve our goals in a sustainable way so that it doesn't impact all of the other areas of our country that are integral to our growth agenda. Now, you're going to hear, I'm sure, that there were some um, discussions with the United Kingdom relating to this offer some time before. And yes, there were discussions. Let me just put in context that those discussions were I don't want to say rejected, but it didn't, they were not advanced. And there were also discussions that were very specific to the jurisdiction being able to identify the specific category of persons that would have been transferred to Jamaica. But it, it was not advanced. It was not accepted by the administration of the day. Also, which I think is important, is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now, Pre-trial detention facilities and prisons in Jamaica are regarded in some instances as poor, that they amount to cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment or punishment. That is Amnesty International. It's a statement relating to potential violation of Articles 7 and 10. So, again, it's not for us to skirt around the issue or to make it seem like we don't have circumstances that need fixing. It needs fixing. That's why we are fixing it. Um, and perhaps if I had my way, it would be fixed in one year. But it is a process, and it has to be fixed within the context of moving the country forward in a cohesive way. This statement, however, is very, very important because it is a catalyst for us to get it done right, but it is also very telling when you assess what must be the contemplation of our partners who want to send prisoners to Jamaica. I have to be very careful because I don't want to give the impression that I starting any firestorm with the United Kingdom. Let me state very clearly and openly that the United Kingdom is one of our strongest partners and will continue to be. And just last week we had discussions with them about a program that they're going to be funding in our Department of Correctional Services for over £100,000 relating to rehabilitation um, activities. So despite this not advancing of this offer, we continue to work with our partners in the United Kingdom through DFID and other means to advance the achieving of our goals and objectives. But it says something to you when you contemplate it because as a sovereign country what the united kingdom has done is they have said to themselves what is best for us but how can we also help our friends and so allow me allow me to at least you know try and so what has been done is it benefits our friends financially, it reduces their risk, and it helps them politically for them to move persons, not persons who are being deported. And let me stop and just explain to you that this confusion, even in the preamble you heard this discussion about deportation, it's a totally different topic. The matter that relates to deportation is not the discussion that we're having now as it relates to this offer. 
because issues relating to deportation are relating to individuals that have spent their time they have served their time and would be expected to have been rehabilitated persons so when you hear jamaicans talking about a plane of deportees coming to jamaica those deportees on that plane that would have been coming from the british institutions would have been persons that have served their time and have been rehabilitated that's a different concept. That's a different concept, most of them. That's a different concept than persons who, during the process, are being transferred to Jamaica for Jamaica to take responsibility and assume risk and all of the benefits, it seems, that would come with that transfer. So, let's put that in context. But as I was saying, the, I see you watching your watch, Peter. I'm, 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 I won't be here, so I have to make use of my time. So, as we move on, and let me welcome Senator uh, Mark Golding, who teaches me so much in Senate. I mean, I know you're going down to the law house soon, but please, we'd love you to stay. Our administration is concerned, and I, I see this. Because, again, I don't want anybody to leave with this incredible fallacy that because we have not advanced this, mean that we are not concerned with overburdened um, state of our facilities. We're concerned with the high numbers of medium-risk inmates held in high-risk facilities. And that is why what we've done is there's a classification committee that would have been working during uh, my friend's time when that classification committee works, what, what they do is they transfer inmates from the overburdened prisons to other facilities. They used to transfer single digits. We are transferring 60 inmates a month now. Last year, four, over, a little over 450 inmates were transferred in a year. In two months, we've transferred almost 300 that is an administration that is focused on rationalizing the population and why do i say so remember two of our facilities are overburdened right now if you are to go to tamarind farm and look on tamarind farm as we have continued the advancement of it it could never be seen as a deplorable facility and so that's where we are focusing our attention on rationalizing how we use institutions so that we can spread it out and in future, abandon the places that need to be abandoned. Next one. Next, next slide. So, these are four things which I'll say quickly. Again, a focus on prevention, a focus on rationalizing the spaces, diversion, and you will agree that for our juveniles, when you look on the numbers from last year or years before to this year, the numbers of juveniles within our juvenile institutions have significantly decreased because we are working with the Ministry of Justice um, to have the child diversion program. And we're also now looking on ways to utilize those spaces in the best possible means. We are trying to also now, we're well not trying, we are now contemplating actually merging, actually whether you, the merging of facilities is something that could work, moving um, them to different spaces if that's something that could work. And from our visits to other countries, we've seen alternative means of holding our wards, our young people. Um, not just keeping them incarcerated for 24 hours, but perhaps alternative options to have them during the day and send them back home etc and then rehabilitation and reintegration and i'll say quickly that we've introduced perhaps four or so very significant flagship programs in rehabilitation one the new path program which started in south camp and metcalf and due to a 2.5 million u.s injection by the oas and usaid we are continuing that program across all of the juvenile institutions. Next slide. 
Most of you already know about CSJP, expansion of the cadet program, and the Prime Minister's program that he discussed this week called LEGS. These are all means towards the prevention of those that are most at risk. Next. Next. All right. I can't even read that, so I doubt that you can. But let me say quickly that with regards to the rehabilitation initiatives, which I, I, I harp on it because, again, when you're looking on the offer that was made, it has to be evaluated within the context of what we can do for ourselves as a people. We have a tendency as a people to believe that we cannot achieve it alone. And that's not to say that I don't believe in partnerships because most of what we have been able to fund, we have done so through negotiation with our partners for this year. But there are things that we can do, and so we have partnered with Heart Trust um, to not only present skills training for our inmates and wards, but certification that will lead to a higher probability of them not returning. Why do I say that that is important? Because a big reason why our facilities, the two, are overburdened is because we still have persons who are coming back. They're reoffending. So if we can stop them through the prevention and then stop them at the other end from reoffending, it complements the program of rehabilitation and rationalization to ultimately do what we as an administration want to do, which is to reduce the population in the institutions, not to increase that population. That does not mean that we don't want better facilities. While we're doing so, we are building towards better facilities. Next. This is just a slide showing some of the rehabilitation activities. We recently constructed a bathroom at Tamarin Farm, which was constructed with collaboration between the inmates and the officers and help from our private citizens. This is some of the training that we have, the culinary arts training and inmates teaching me um, some textile. And I say this because again, you have to put this debate in the context that we are doing rehabilitation activities. And that's the number one thing that you're gonna hear. We need this facility because of rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is taking place now, and we have found that, at least I can speak for the last year, and the Commission of Corrections is here as well, that we have been able to boost the rehabilitation activities because of that priority shift and the focus on it. Next. We recently introduced chicken rearing again to New Broughton, and we just have also done so at Richmond Farm, where we are able now to produce enough eggs and kalaloo and pop chow for the inmates that are cultivating that to feed themselves across all 11 institutions. Listen, I would, I would never say that you didn't do so. And I have given you, your, one thing you can say about me, Mr. Bunning, is I've given you credit whenever it is due. These chickens were just put in there. So unless, <laughs> unless you, Unless you came and put them in <laughs> without me knowing. <laughs> so we'll talk about you coming into the institution without approval. Again, we recently put the, I don't know about you, you know, Peter, but <laughs> we have to talk about your access to the institution. Again, let me say, I thought that we recently put them in. Mr. Bunding is saying he put them in. I'm not going to argue with, with my senior colleague. Um, so we also have Kalilu cultivation at New Broughton and Diamond Crest and other places. And again, this is, this is not something that is brand new. Um, as I'd said to you before, rehabilitation is not new to this administration. It's not something that has been invented by me. It wasn't invented by Mr. Bunting either. It wasn't started by him. Rehabilitation has been a priority for all administrations, including Mr. Bunting's. I am not here to be it rubbish. I'm here to say to you that in the context of whether or not we can do it, we are showing that we are getting it done and we have boosted those activities that 
uh, Mr. Bunting and others have started. With regards to the rationalization of our spaces, as I said to you before, um, we have the new block which we have inherited and we have enhanced. We have accelerated the transfer from overcrowded facilities. Um, and I gave you the numbers before, and we continue to boost. We're in phase two of our monitoring program. One was done before unsuccessfully um, in other times, and we are doing this one. We actually have inmates that are now being electronically, electronically monitored. And so it seems as if it's going to be successful. This is just to show some of the expenditure on the refurbishing activities. You would have been aware that we recently moved our ladies from Fort Augusta because it was not in a condition that was fitting and accommodating. And so, guess what? We understand that there's a need for better facilities. And so we have moved them to better facilities. Is it as good as the facility that would have been in, in the United Kingdom? Perhaps not, but we're going to get there. And we're going to get there without putting ourselves in a place that we cannot uh, handle financially. And so you see that we've spent $155 million on retrofitting, and we continue to do so at the South Camp facility, which is a form of Fort Augusta um, ladies. And there are some other repair and maintenance that is taking place across Tower Street, St. Catherine, especially because those are the places that are overburdened. Um, and we're now looking towards um, the juvenile centers for this year. Next. Next. Okay. I know you all wanted to see that word, conclusion. <laughs> but I have to use my little time. Um, let me say this. One of the things that you're going to debate, and it is, it is important, why don't we have a facility, a real maximum security facility in Jamaica that is fitting of the kind of criminals that we have. Um, well, let me say this. I, I'm going to take the liberty of announcing that we are contemplating doing so and that we have allocated money towards the land acquisition and the design concept of what will be a supermax um, facility. Again, I don't think that started with it, within my mind or within our minds, but we are looking towards successfully moving to that place where the worst of the worst can be in a proper facility that can hold them. Um, and the most I can say is that we have already identified at least four locations. We have engaged in discussions with a number of providers in relation to how it would be built out and what the cost would be. And when those specifics are available, we'll move into it. But I have to say it so that you understand that we are not an administration that does not get it. We get it. It needs to be done. But it has to be done within a context that is looking on the priority for this country. And so, yes, um, I'll, I'll close by just saying this. A gentleman said to me when he heard that I was coming here that if he was living in a house and was to have an offer to move from his house, and somebody would pay down the first year of the mortgage, maybe even five of the 30-year mortgage, and it would be in a bigger, beautiful house, would he take it? He would want to take it, but he would have to contemplate whether or not it would be the best move for his family, because he has children in his home, and he has to send them to school, and he has to feed them, and it doesn't mean that he doesn't want that better house. So don't think that this discussion has to be a black or white. It's a matter of shifting priorities based on administrations having different policy perspectives. Um, I'm hoping that I can at least stay for uh, the second keynote speaker, but again, I crave your indulgence if you see me running out. Thank you.
As we continue to look at the, the UK offer, we have been told to say not UK deal, but UK offer um, to deal with correctional institutions. Let, help me welcome Mr. Bunting to the podium. Thank you. Um, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, as my younger colleague parliamentarian took up the majority of both his and my time, I'm going to abandon my prepared text and just speak to a few of the highlights um, that I think is important to, for our understanding of the issue. Let me just start by saying uh, much of the, the talk about the, the good intentions for rehabilitation, to reduce overcrowding, to, uh, you know, to not have deplorable conditions. Has been, I've been hearing that from I was, you know, first time in Parliament in the, in the 90s. I know at least from Katie Knight's time, um, and probably even before, but I've been following it from then, we've, there's been talk of the urgent need for a new prison or correctional facility. The, but when you become minister and you do your first tour and you see a five by nine cell at Tower Street, five by nine is about twice the size of one of these desks here. And you see three adult men with a slot bucket, and a slot bucket is really a nice way of saying a bucket of in excrement because that's all they have. They have no a basin, they have no water, they have no toilets. So they have a slot bucket and three adult meals in a five by nine cell, spending 19 hours a day. You are seized with a certain urgency to do something. And I want to just make it clear, most of these young men, these young Jamaican men, 60% in fact of prison admissions consists of young people between the age, ages of 18 to 35 who are in for sentences between three months and three years. These are not all murderers, rapists, and hardened criminals. These are young Jamaican men. But what do you think happens when these youngsters are held in one of our maximum security prisons? And by the way, all the pictures of rehabilitation were shown for the medium or low security prisons, not at, at Tower Street. What do you think happens when those youngsters are held in one of our maximum security prisons 19 hours a day in a five by nine cell with two other adult males and a slop bucket. Well, they can become hardened, they can become angry, they can become bitter, they can become, when they get back on the outside, the biggest headache to law enforcement. And potentially some of them, not just potentially, but many of them contribute to our unacceptably high murder rate when they're released back into the society. It is therefore in the country's national interest that our inmates are not just rehabilitated, but prepared for reintegration into the society. And we need a healthy prison system to do this. For 20 years, successive governments have been bedeviled with how to solve this problem in our correctional system. For all very good reasons, you know, we've had to prioritize education, health, infrastructure, but we could never come get around to building a new maximum security facility. So the issue was not, are we in favor of, of prisoner transfers? Um, quite frankly, I am not in favor of just having prisoners transferred to, to Jamaica. Our laws, our, our laws don't provide for it. We would have had to, to pass specific laws. But what we were really engaging on a path, which was some out-of-box thinking, was not primarily about a prisoner transfer. 
It was primarily about taking these 3,000 young Jamaicans out of conditions that, quite frankly, were so poor that Amnesty International, um, the UN Committee on Human Rights, all said that those conditions amounted to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. And th this is coming from a number of investigations and reports. And the truth is that we can't, 55 years on, as an independent country, be treating, or put this way, we are obliged, I believe, regardless of the material resources of the state, we're obliged to treat all detained and imprisoned people with humanity and respect for the inherent dignity of the human person. And this was what our goal was, to find a way to achieve this. Now, we had not signed a prisoner transfer agreement. We had signed a non-binding memorandum of understanding, but which could potentially have led to a prisoner transfer agreement. Now, I just want to step back and say, you know, even without that, we had done, I believe, a tremendous amount during our administration in, in terms of improving the correctional system. First to begin with, we had reduced the, the numbers by about 15% or 600. Um, and in fact, we, when, when I became minister, we had about 4,400. We reduced that to about 3,800 or so when I left. We cut the number of juveniles by half. We separated, got an absolute separation of juveniles from adults, both male and female, for the first time. The, we, we built the first new building, the first new dormitory building, brand new dormitory building, probably in decades, the 300-bed facility, which we signed a contract in 2015, and which the dormitory was finished in 2016, but the ancillary facilities are, are being completed now. So, and we started that process of, as, as Minister said, of reclassifying. But the truth is, as much as he has... He says he has accelerated it, and as much as we started it, we still have Tower Street Correctional Center today. Some may call it General Penitentiary. We still have it at twice the capacity for which it was built and designed in slavery times. At twice the capacity today than what it was designed and built. And this was before the emancipation of slavery. The, that facility was built in the um, early 19th century, Tower Street, and the Spanish Town District, uh, the St. Catherine District, rather, Adult Correctional Cent Cent um, Facility, was built in the 17th century. Or some of the, the buildings there were, were, were done in the 17th, started in the 17th century. So what we're talking about is are facilities that are to 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 say that they're dilapidated would be speaking euphemistically. They're literally falling apart. They have limited scope for rehabilitation. They're severely overcrowded. They are substandard and inhumane. And God forbid we should have something you know, like an earthquake, even a medium intensity earthquake, we could have a catastrophe at these facilities. And I want to say, while, we're, while I'm talking here primarily about the human rights of the inmates, but don't forget there are just as many correctional staff who work in the correctional system and are also exposed to the risks of an earthquake or other natural disaster that could end up with massive loss of life. So forgive me if I seemed ready to try radical things.
to go for something that may not be ideal, but certainly, to my mind, the lesser of the two evils. It seemed the first real shot that we had of financing a new purpose-built modern facility focused on rehabilitation and integration. The, just in brief, as I said, we had not signed a, a, a prisoner transfer agreement. We had signed a, an MOU. And what that had provided for was a 25 million pound grant towards the construction of the facility and a approximately five million pound grant for reintegration of um, prisoners back into society when they'd finished their, their, um, their sentence. What I should say here is that the, the terms of the agreement, because there's been a lot of misunderstanding about that, people seem to feel that the UK could send anybody back to Jamaica. That's not so. It was only Jamaican citizens who would have been deported anyway at the end of their sentence. It was only those who had exhausted all their legal proceedings and exhausted all appeals. And even then, we had provided for a case-by-case -case, um, review that we would not be obliged to take anyone who we felt, for example, um, was a terrorist. Now, we would ultimately have to take them, by the way, because when they finish their sentence, if they're Jamaicans and they have no other um, citizenship, you know, the international law says you can't make this person stateless. So we would always have to accept them. Um, but we would have, we did not have to accept them early, so to speak. They, we could have said that they had to finish their sentence. There was obviously a lot of negotiating left to be done. But when we started, and I, you know, I, I don't, the, the young Minister of State wasn't there back then, but Senator Dwight Nelson, in his own words, had said they had attempted to negotiate an agreement, and it had fallen through because the British government had, were under financial constraints at the time, and that's why it had not been carried forward. And as quoted, I can give you where he's quoted in the Observer newspaper, certainly a friendly newspaper for him. Um, <laughs> but all I'm saying, there's been no, there is no agreement. It was an, uh, an MOU to attempt, to consider, to explore whether you could have negotiated a mutual acceptable agreement. But non-binding MOU. So... At the end of the day, you know, I, administrations are, are, are sovereign in a sense. Well, parliament is sovereign, but administrations must pursue their own policies. And I have no problem if they don't want to um, continue those negotiations with the UK. But what is not acceptable to me is to postpone for the next five years or 10 years or 20 years dealing with the subhuman and degrading conditions that now exist in our maximum security facilities. Thank you. We have to explore more deeply the conditions and probably why we refused. But we have heard two sides of the story. And now I know the minister wants to rush back to his son. So I am going to allow two questions directed to the minister, and the others could be directed to the opposition's spokesperson. Anybody has questions for the minister? Please line up in the standing mic that you see. He is going to um, take two questions before he leaves. And then uh, please identify yourself. Do we have another question? The person can line up immediately behind this person. Oh, okay. Um, somebody said, somebody in the audience said they had a question. Minister, I really don't think you did service to the topic. Uh, what were the conditionalities attached to this 25 pound, 25 million pound grant to build a prison? And, um, 
were their reciprocity in the agreement because I, not a lawyer, but I do know there is no way that Jamaica could accept Jamaicans who were serving time in British prison to finish their sentences in Jamaica, no matter how bad our prisons are and no matter how bad we want a new prison. Your laws would need to be amended. The constitution would need to be amended. And who is going to give them a police clearance certificate? Now, I don't think we are hearing everything concerning this 25 million grant. And we need to get some light on the matter. Thank you. Thank you. But let me say, um, in general terms, that yes, you're correct. And that's exactly what I said to Mr. Bonding a while ago, that the $25 million would never have been presented to Jamaica without the prison transfer agreement at some point being signed. And so, yes, there was no prison transfer agreement signed, but the conditionalities within the memorandum of understanding would have moved us towards a place that would require, and I think um, Member of Parliament said it, require um, amendments to our legislation and passing of new legislation to accommodate the transfer of prisoners in, a, in order for us to receive um, the $25 million pound um, donation or gift. Um, so yes, you're correct. And there are a number of other things that were within the terms and condition of that memorandum of understanding that may not have detailed with specificity every single thing. But in general terms, our country would have had to move to a place to make those accommodations for us to accept the, the, the prisoners. That is without a doubt. Or there would be no offer in this context. And so that's why we've moved away from discussing it, because it's not acceptable to us. It is acceptable to Mr. Bunting and his administration. And it's not acceptable to them because they want bad for Jamaica. That is what they feel is best. We feel it is better to go a different direction, which is not to accept um, those terms. And that is why we've moved away from it. Mr. Levy has a question for you. When your government announced in January of this year that you were <clears throat> refusing the offer, which I'm not disputing, but uh, well, of the British government, your government declined to give a reason for the refusal. I found that I said that when this government, the present government, announced that it was refusing to accept the British offer for the prison, it also said it also declined, refused to give a reason why it was rejecting it. I found that refusal extremely offensive. I want to know from the minister why no reason was given. Deliberations from our now Prime Minister, that was then opposition leader, have made it clear that in relation to cost, in relation to differences in strategic priorities and other issues, that this is not something that we would accept. I know that when we were in Senate, certain, discussion, certain questions were posed. And in the circumstances relating to those questions, there had to be a process which was carried out. I believe the process could have been handled in a better way so that it could have avoided persons at least perceiving or assuming that there's some reason to hide. And I've, I've vocalized that, and I think I'm not the only person who has said that. But that process was carried out, and it took some time and uh, the questions were answered as they were put. So I don't think it's just a matter of refusing to answer. I think the questions were answers, uh, answered as they were put in Senate. No, there was a refusal, sir. No reason was given. It was publicly but, but asked and no reason was given. And what I'm saying to you is, it's, it's, it has been stated by the leader of government business um, in Senate that in answering those questions, that there are ongoing discussions that we are having with our international partners. And that because of the sensitivity 
of those discussions and as well because we continue to partner with the United Kingdom. We did not see it fit, and we still don't see it fit, to try to rehash terms and conditions of what Mr. Bunting says. It's not even an agreement that he signed, a memorandum of understanding, where we have already stated that we do not think it is in the country's interest to move forward, and where it has been in the public domain for a long time, that the issues relating to cost and issues relating to the shift in priority are clear aspects of why the administration has not moved forward. I laid out a while ago, if you want to take it as a response to it, a number of issues. I haven't hidden from it, I've told you. There are a number of things that as an administration we have contemplated. We have also listened to our people. I think the administration before also listened. They didn't move forward with the, with the offer either. The question is why didn't that administration move forward? It was a memorandum of, of, of understanding was signed in 2015. Steps weren't taken to move it forward either. So we have moved to a place where we are focusing on taking the necessary steps to put in place the better infrastructure, to focus on rehabilitation activities, and to design the kind of activities around the DCS that will improve the tenure of the persons that were within our custody. That is what we have done. You want us to move back, and we want to move forward. No, no, I don't and want you to move back at all. We continue to move forward. It is not us who went into any negotiation. No, I... And so therefore, the question as to why you haven't moved forward should be answered by the, by the former administration. Why did they not move forward? That's the question that should be answered. Minister, I commend many of the things... I commend many of the things that you're doing from what you've said. So don't misunderstand my question. To begin yes. with. No, I, I thought that there was a clear dereliction of duty at that point, that the government should, your government should yes. have stated why it was rejecting. And it did not state this. It just said, we're not taking it. Well, Full step, right? In relation to the communication aspect, I have accepted that, and I've said it to you before, that there are certain issues relating to that Cool, let's move on. Let's move on. That right. caused for us not to go into those, sure. those specific matters. All right? Okay, um, the minister has said he will take one more question. So, yes, thank you. All right, my name is Michelle Makala, and I'm from National Organization for Deported Migrants. I myself was deported, and um, for me, for rehabilitation in Jamaica, we, persons cannot rehabilitate in Jamaica under these conditions. At one point, I had said the prison was a good thing, but people don't even want to come back here to finish their time. Because on refusing these people from coming here, from building this prison, my organization was formed by persons who are deported ourselves. And I don't know if it's because of the newscast or the way they go about it when a charter flight comes from England, it frightens the people in Jamaica. But every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, our organization pick up the same persons, one by one, six, two, four, from Montego Bay Airport who are being sent back here. So whether you build the prisons or not, these people are coming. I am the person who would document all these persons. And our organization was formed six years ago. And every last Thursday of every month, 60, 80, 75 persons are sent back from America. And a lot of persons don't know about it. So I think it's because of the, all the news bring it about deportation, deportees are coming back. Most of these people are coming back now from the UK. Are people who have oversteered their times. The last time we, we, we pick up a, a man who was 74 years old. He has been there for 50 years and hasn't been straightened out, and he has Alzheimer's, and they send him down. And our work that we do in Jamaica, I don't think enough of these 
politicians know about it, what we are doing. Because we keep tab on everybody, even if some of the pastors that you see preaching on the TV, some of them be, have been deported, you know. <laughs> Teachers, police, doctors, a lot of them have been deported. But this stigmatization on deportees that is coming back or the frightening, frightening the people in Jamaica about deportees, we must stop use us as scapegoat and get on of what needs to be done in Jamaica. And because when one, one party in power say yes to one thing, the other one come in, they do have a reason, they say no. Not just your party, but that's how Jamaica is. If a school is building nearby the JLP, when the PMP come in, it stop and they build one in front of it. But we must stop use deportation as a scapegoat because most per we have a lot of successful stories in Jamaican persons that are being deported. Because our um, organization of data and everybody, we do follow-ups, we look about persons who are sick, who are in the hospitals, we are like the next parent to them. So we must not use deportation as a scapegoat and stop frightening the people about deportees. There are several different categories of persons that are deported, including persons that have overstayed with a number of immigration-related issues, and also persons that, have, that might have completed their sentences and served their time, gone through their rehabilitation activities and are being sent back to their place uh, of state. Now, it's a separate issue. It's not an issue that relates to the discussion today because the discussion is not about deportees that have overstayed. It's not about deportees with any minor or immigration-related matters. The discussion is about a desire for one jurisdiction to shift burden and risks, financial and otherwise, from itself to another. It's as simple as that. They're not try it's not a matter of deported persons. This relates to a prison, a, a potential prison transfer agreement. And let's get that clear. In relation to your other issue of uh, whether there is some of this usual political uh, myopic attitude of because PMP started, we're not going to continue it. Because JLP started it, we're not going to continue it. Let me say to you this. There is no way that anybody could reasonably suggest that this administration has not assessed and continued the very positive things that started by the former administration. Because when I'm in Senate, every day, Senator Golding says, this was started by us. What you're going to find is that every administration in opposition is going to say, when it suits them, it was started by me. Crime is never started by the opposition. But everything that is good is started by the opposition. As we are government now, and perhaps we did it too, perhaps as opposition, we could, you could find places where we said similar things. I'm in government. So I have to think like the government, and I have to act like the government, and I have to be responsible like the government, and I don't have the latitude to think in a particular way. And so therefore, as government, we have to be responsible, not just with the contemplation of how a bigger facility would help. We have to think about the transfer of international persons and the mixing in one facility, the type of rehabilitation activities we have in Jamaica, is it more agricultural? Is it more X or Y? How do we rationalize the spaces that we have now in government with the budget we have to make sure that we put in place activities that are sustainable? Is it going to benefit us to take this $25 million now plus whatever would help us for the four years and then have a number of things to do with regards to the maintenance thereafter? It doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that a good facility is bad. We love a good facility. But is there another alternative that could achieve the same goals 
and treat with the facility issues. We have determined that for us, based on our focus, which we have to put into our entire growth agenda, because how we're looking at it is in a comprehensive way. And you can laugh, you know, because it's, it's, it's very serious. As a government, you have to think not in silos. You can't think of it in an isolated way as you have bad institutions, you want to take 25 million to build a good one and wasam all of your things, it's a solution. We can't. You have to think about it in the context of all of the things that impact us as, a, as variables and considerations. So, believe me when I say, even with regards to the, deport, the deportees, we are moving now with discussion with the same part, and you know, to build out a processing facility to help our, the deportees, right? And to present social uh, reform activities to help our deportees, because we've recognized that need. So believe me, we are moving and we're taking those positive steps. Yes? Okay. By the time I was 24, I had four kids and I started running with the wrong crowd. And we are end up in England doing whatever and went to prison. But going to prison for me was one of the best things because I was a bright person in school and yes. I, grew, I grew up very good. Yes. And when I was there, I got the chance to do everything that I, I didn't get to do here in Jamaica, passing the exam, getting certified, honorable and all those things with honors and high honors and yes. all of that. And one course struck out that changed my life forever. It was called the Enhanced Thinking Skills yes. course that we did in England. And when I did that course, it was very in-depth and it changed my mind, changed my life for the better yes. because it made me look at things different. I never see things like that. I was just a one I just do things, I never used to think about the consequences or, you know, what going to happen after I do something bad. So I think in, when, I, when, I am, when I came back to Jamaica and people are on about the prison thing and the, I think the, 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 the programs and the, the fact that people are there every day in their cells not doing nothing. That's, that's, that's not true. Most of them. L let me tell you this. Yeah. You're going to be, yeah. let's talk. I'd like to have the opportunity yeah. to show you the We yeah. Transform program, the Learning by Doing programs, yes. the programs that we have started in the last year that are focused on enhancing our, our MOU with heart. Yeah. I'd like to show you the persons who have taken CXC and passed. Yes. I'd like to show you how we are moving with our Correctional um, Services Council and the subcommittees to drive vocational and learning training. We yes. actually have now 36 of our officers being trained as trainers to make sure that we don't have skills training but certification. Yeah. We're doing the things that you speak about. It's not all happening just like that. Understand, yeah. do I want it to be happening faster? Yes, That's I do. Good. But I have to look on the context and move it in a pace so it is sustainable. Yeah. And believe me when I tell you, one of the th reasons that I'm very concerned about this MOU or why I was when it was on the table mm -hmm. Again, remember, this 25 million pounds help we'd get to build out this large facility to put everybody in. Yeah. The persons like yourself yes. that would be able to take advantage of the kind of facilities that you have taken advantage of yeah. would have been moved from that environment. And people believe that just building up walls alone is going to transform our system, it's not. Yeah. What we are focused on, and I'm not saying that in, you are saying it, what we are focused on, and you can ask the Commission of Correction, is not just building better facilities, but developing the skill set of our staff, building up the opportunities for our correctional officers. We sent away 26, or more than 26 officers to Colorado last year to get training, to come back, because their focus now is on building prison industry to start industry within the facilities. And we're, we're doing more and more of those things. Does it need to be better? Yes, it does. Are we have a far way to go? Yes, we do. Are we taking the right steps forward? Yes, we are. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, students, welcome. And the next voice you will hear from the panel will be Professor Bernard Headley, but 
He is not here today, so we will try to reach him on Skype. Yeah. Let me just say um, good evening and greetings to everyone. I regret very much that I'm not there to be part of the activities with you. I'm battling a very challenging illness, but the good news is that I'm fighting it. I have been able to follow so far much of the discussion with this amazing technology we have. Um, I first want to commend, of course, Celesis for organizing this event, Professor Algu Lee, Henry Lee, and Dr. Desia Leslie. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that they're doing. This year was a student of mine many years ago, and I'm just so proud of her accomplishments and that she's engaged in the way she is in, in, in this kind of very topical discussion. It's, it's great to see Celesis focusing on perhaps one of the neglected areas of academic concerns in Jamaica when it comes to crime and criminality. And that is in the area of, of offender rehabilitation. We, we've done a lot of work in terms of policing research, a lot of work in lawmaking, but we haven't really focused as much as we should academically on offender rehabilitation. And so this is a commend, commendable bit of work being done here by ACL. Um, I, I heard bits and pieces of presentations by Minister Charles and um, MP Bunting. I, again, I, I, I learned from Mr. Charles that some of the things that I, 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 I have in mind, some of the things that I would propose already being undertaken there. I think in many ways he says that they got it and from what I hear, as far as rehabilitation is concerned, you know, if, if, if the words are correct, of course, they, they got it. Um, what I did not hear from Mr. Charles is, what are we going to do about this 25 million pound offer? I heard from um, MP Bunting, I felt his pain as he talked about the inhumanity of the conditions at both Tower Street and Spanish Town. Um, but, but I'm getting from Mr. Bunting, and perhaps I'm wrong, what he is envisioning is a replacement, a modern replacement of Tower Street and, um, and Spanish Town. The British are proposing a mass incarceration center. They're proposing a 1,500 to 2,000 bed facility. And if I'm hearing Mr. Bunting right, you know, this would be a replacement for what is existing. And I think that would be going in the wrong direction, but he's nonetheless right in talking about the inhumanity. Let me see if I can take a few minutes or really focus on what I think is, is, is the question before us, the question before me certainly, is the British have offered 25 million pounds to build for us a facility. Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, the government of the day has put a pause, if not a stop. We're not sure which one it is. Is it a pause, it is a stop uh, to this $25 million offer. What should we do about it? Here, here's what I'm concerned. I have few concerns about the offer. I propose, number one, that we accept in spirit, in spirit, the $25 million offer, but it should be repurposed. We should, we should engage the British in a discussion of repurposing that $25 million offer. I, I think the British are reasonable enough to engage in a discussion of repurposing, rather than flat out rejecting repurposing. So that's my, my essential argument. 
I, I object to the offer on three principal grounds. Number one, I think I, I, as I reflect on it philosophically and ethically, I, I, I find the offer in a way anathema, distasteful. Uh, consider why it is the British are asking us to do. They're telling us, we'll give you money to build a prison, and when you build this prison, we are going to send back to you offenders for you to house them, for you to feed them, for you to clothe them. Um, that to me sounds in a way like an offer for the country to be a, a prison colony. There were some countries uh, four or five hundred years ago that were British prison colonies. I, I, I tremble and I'm troubled at the fact that what we could be asked to be doing in this modern day, this modern era, is to become a prison farm, an outsourced prison farm for, for Britain to, to offshore its prison population. Even though, admittedly, conceded, I conceive they are all, we're talking about our Jamaican citizens, but they are their offenders. So I, I, I trouble the notion of, of, of Spanish Town and Tower Street in outposts of, of, of British uh, prisoners. My, my second, my second um, concern is this. Um, I worry that the offer could be seen, if not practically seen, as us working with the British at removing we're deliberately removing uh, immigrants of, 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 of a racial kind that is Britain actually wants to get rid of. Um, if, if one were to recall um, David um, Cameron's campaign of maybe eight, nine years ago, the campaign was based a lot on the notion of we want to make Britain white again. And so the Tories came to power under the notion of reducing or solving or managing a racial immigrant problem. Is this notion of sending back Jamaicans, Caribbeans, Nigerians, to their homeland to do prison time, a way of managing, of reducing. It certainly is a way of fulfilling one of the tourist promises to the electorate. My, my, my third word is that the offer as it stands does not meet Jamaica's critical crime needs. Our critical crime needs cannot be solved by a maximum security prison. Maximum security does not equal rehabilitation. Maximum security, I think as Carolyn Cooper argues, is a place where yardies are going to meet up on a yardies and you know they're going to plan other gang crimes. So I, I argue on and I, I, I'm hoping that Celestis will distribute the paper that I, I left with them. I developed several different points as to what I think or what I suggest, what I recommend, the offer to be structured around. Can I stop at that right now? Thank you very much, okay, Professor well, Headley. Um, I will just ask, thank you. OK, Mr. Levy. I accept Minister Charles's reconceptualization of the, the concept that we're dealing with. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's appropriate. We're, we really want to start off from where we are at, uh, not from a foreign offer. I can understand and I accept uh, former Minister Bunting's explanation of how he came to sign the Memorandum of Understanding. Obviously, he was well-intentioned, uh, which, however, raises, creates for us, the rest of us Jamaicans, the ongoing problem conundrum, really, of so many things that need to be changed in our country. 
and having well-intentioned ministers and leaders, but the thing's not changing. Uh, how does it come about? Why does it happen? Uh, are we partly responsible ourselves? But that is the reality. Um, I saw the Memorandum of Understanding for the first time myself a couple of days ago, missing two pages. Um, don't quite know how, the person who sent it to me, but two pages missing. And what struck me immediately, what was obvious, was that this was a, a prison transfer agreement, PTA. That is clear and manifest. This is the agreement, of course, the, the MOU I'm talking about, that uh, Peter here, Bunting, signed. And he was explaining why he came to sign it. What is clear, therefore, from reading this MOU is that the, and from the circumstances of the whole thing, is that the British offer of 25 million uh, for the prison um, was entirely in order to bring about this prison transfer. There was no other reason for it at all. Um, as other documents have made clear, um, it would relieve, once the prison was built, it would relieve the British taxpayer of 10 million pounds a year um, paid for, to pay for the support of Jamaicans in their prisons. So this was the, the motive behind the whole thing. And this is the condition for accepting of it. And as the condition, therefore, I, I would not want Jamaica to accept this offer. Right? Uh, I think we have enough prisoners of our own, uh, and for all the historic reasons, which will, uh, and the, the, the national reasons, which I'm sure Bert will bring forward, we couldn't possibly accept such an offer. Um, I would like to agree with uh, Professor Headley uh, that the British ought to, just as they have apprehended, uh, detect, uh, had the crime committed on their soil, apprehended the offender, tried him, they should continue to have the responsibility to, to keep that person in their prisons. Um, it's completely logical, it's completely uh, straightforward. And this is how it has been for the longest while, internationally. But internationally, in recent years, things are changing. And now transfers between governments and states are taking place, right? In Europe, for example. And one of the arguments is to, uh, for moving a citizen from state A, uh, he's a citizen of state A, he commits a crime in state B, uh, to move him back to his state is to get him closer to his family and so on, to make rehabilitation easier. Which, of course, in our case, uh, where a person has been living in the UK for 25 years, you know, is the reverse and doesn't work. But that's part of the motivation for these transfers. And legally, I believe, every state has the right to decide to remove a citizen who has committed a crime in, his, in that country to, to decide that that, con that person should be sent back to their state if they have no legal uh, uh, right to be there. So, you know, that is the position we're in. And what is saving us, in a way, thank you, from having the UK send back Jamaicans in their prisons is the fact that our prison conditions are so bad. And not just because UK has a higher standard itself, the fact is that United Nations standards and covenants are now preventing a country from sending uh, a delinquent who is not their citizen back to their home country. They are not allowed to do it if that prisoner is going to find himself or herself in horrific conditions. So. The bad conditions of our prisons uh, are saving us from having uh, Jamaicans sent back to Jamaica. Very proper. Hmm? 
so that's that's where we're at. Um, so the position I've taken is that uh, is one of agreement with the that of the present government to not accept the money because of the condition uh, which is attached to it. If we can negotiate with them to remove that condition, uh, well and good. Well, then we could accept the offer. And obviously, we need assistance. What we have to do is to begin to plan within a time frame, a reasonable time frame, not 10 or 20 years from now. We never got a time frame from Minister Charles. Uh, they have the plans. They won't do it, but when? Uh, the fact is that with one out of every two, almost one out of every two inmates uh, in our prisons going back out to commit a crime, if we are serious about reducing the crime level in this country and the murder rate, then we have to do something about our prisons. Uh, it's not an if or a but, and it's not just a when. It has to be very, very soon. Uh, but more basically, then all of that is the need for us as Jamaicans to really confront uh, and force our political leaders to take action to do something about the terrible conditions which Carla here is more familiar with than I am. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, in this saga of building or not building uh, a new prison, there are several elements. One somehow has been already made clear by Horace. I was quite, I am not a politician, so I feel free to say exactly what I think that as a human rights group should do. I was very disturbed from the idea that somebody <coughs> decided that they don't want to manage an amount of Jamaicans in the prison and made an offer which was all inclusive. The package was there, already done, already decided, and there was no possibility to discuss on the other side as partners how, if, when, in which way. I felt it very, um, I felt very uncomfortable with the idea that somebody was telling all this, and we build a prison for them and basically would have discriminate the Jamaican prisoners which were not going to access so easily to a new beautiful building. I think that that was one of the reasons why the full country has been discussing and debating how and why UK has made a move like this. Say, saying that, Jamaica, uh, J uh, Stand Up for Jamaica is working as an NGO in the prison since almost 10 years. And if somebody asks me a straight question, which is, do you believe that a new prison is needed? My answer is yes. It is well, well needed. There are many different reasons. Let's just try to focus on a couple of them. First one. I heard a lot about rehabilitation. That is my bread, my everyday dream, to introduce rehabilitation in a massive way because people need to recognize that this is one of the many ways to fight crime. Serving time is there, is a black hole. People are in there with no instruments. They reach with no instruments, and we risk to send them out without any form of improvement. This is a missing chance. A missing chance for everybody, because it's a missing chance for the inmate himself, but it's a missing chance for who is outside, because if we received back at home, in his family, his, in his community, somebody which did not learn anything opposite got heavily frustrated, heavily angered, and when he's coming back, he's ready again. Uh, it was mentioned one out of two is coming back. I don't know if it's one out of two or three, but it's still lots of them that I see coming back to the institution every couple of weeks. So when we talk about rehabilitation, 
Rehabilitation means a lot of things. It means schools, means laboratories, means spaces, and uh, to, pro to be progressive and do those things, uh, you need to have an infrastructure so which is going to allow the, the various activities to be successful. Otherwise, you have them on paper, a school. The school are closed, they open, it's raining, when it's raining the roof is leaking. So the school is not working as it is supposed to be working. So I, I, I think we should be very realistic and say that if we, if we have a password rehabilitation, then you have to set it in place really and truly, not just to leave it as an idea. It's not an idea, it's an instrument. And if you don't use an instrument, as I said, you miss a big goal. But rehabilitation, again, we, we, we are talking about the possibility for, for them, for the judge calls and clients or customers instead of inmates. I love that. To, to, to build along the serving time, to build. That time is a building time where people can avoid to go back where they come from. We are talking, everybody in Jamaica is keeping talking about crime and violence as an emergency, as a priority. I can, I remember that there are almost 5,000 people which are there. And that could be the biggest school in Jamaica. I heard somebody talking about Sometimes ago, somebody's mentioning, huh, instead of building prison, why don't we build schools? That is a school, and is a vital school, and is a school from where you can produce outside a big, huge, significant change. That change can happen only if you have the possibility to set in place the beautiful things that we see on paper. Um, rehabilitation is also including something else, which is building through all these activities, the education, the professional skill, the idea for a man to still be a human being with dignity, pride, and self-awareness. Let me make a stupid example. How you can build this in a person if there are 27 bathrooms for 1,650 clients? You can't do that. Because you will have to stand naked in line, you will have to be humiliated, you will have... So, I know that the money is not there. I know that is a big problem. Um, same as everybody in Jamaica, we know that we have to accept also compromises, right? Because this is also a matter of funds. But if we have to accept compromises and say that we cannot afford to build a prison, let's say it that we cannot afford to build a prison, not that we do not need to build prison. Because according to whoever is working in that situations and grounds, you know how difficult, how challenging, and also financially can be a, a loss. Because you invest 200 to achieve three, due to the fact that you cannot do exactly what you are supposed to be doing. I don't want to carry on that for too long, but I just really want to remind everybody when discussion on, on prisons, on crime, on new buildings, old buildings and projects um, has an impact. It has an impact on the 5,000, 4,700 which are there, but it has a huge impact with all the ones which are not there yet and hopefully are not willing to go there. Thank you. I am an attorney for the past 38 years. I entered the General Penitentiary in 1977, 40 years ago, as a law student, and I've been going to that prison for the past 40 years. 
I was there two weeks ago. I'm also aware that our parliament in April 2011 passed a new charter of fundamental rights and section 14.5 of that charter says, any person deprived of his liberty shall be treated humanely and with respect for the inherent dignity of the person. If I could borrow the language of that section and go to Mr. Cameron's visit in September 2015, when he touched the soil of Jamaica, which I described elsewhere, that he was entering when he landed at the airport a crime scene. He came here, first prime minister in 14 years to have visited us, and had the audacity to say to us that we should move on from the painful legacy of slavery and not deal with that issue. He came to Jamaica when reparations for slavery by the British was being hotly debated. And when he was asked to speak on it, he refused to debate it with us and then had in his hand the British export of their problems for our so-called prisoners. Uh, the perspective that I come from is not constrained by the confession of Minister who spoke, he said, and I quote the minister who spoke this about an hour ago, he says, I don't have the latitude to think another way other than to deal with the way that he has been dealing. I do have no such constraints. I'm prepared to speak openly that when the British has sought to export a problem that they have, to, as Mr. Levy has said, that would cost them and save them rather 10 million pounds per year, we cannot look at this issue without looking at our history. In 1838, on the 1st of August, when the chains were removed, Jamaica and all Jam African Jamaicans were 100% illiterate, 100% unemployed. We had prison conditions and the conditions in our lockups in 1865, which the Honorable Bogle, the Honorable William Gordon spoke about, the conditions in our prisons, and because they took to self-defense, they were hanged by the British. Then we had, stepping forward, the First and Second World Wars, when we were able to enter Britain with our birth certificate and nothing else to fight their wars. Then later on, we were able to go without paying for a visa. And then when they were through with us, we now have to have a visa to go there. We have to have a visa to go to Her Majesty's Privy Council, the final court. So that we must look at this so-called gift and what it connotes. No one can tell me more than I know about the conditions in prison. I have clients who are guilty who are there. I have clients who are innocent who are there. I have clients who have been there for the past 25 years. I'm aware of the harsh conditions. I am aware of the fact that an earthquake would affect that rotten place more than any other building in Jamaica. But at the same time, I think that we should not allow our dignity to be exchanged for gifts, or so-called gifts to being given to us. Quite recently, thank you. Quite recently, we have had a poor family, and if the allegations are correct, who was being offered grocery on a weekly basis while the young female in the home was being exploited. It is not every gift that we get should be taken. And therefore, Cameron was caught laying a wreath in memory of the Holocaust of the Germans two years before he came here in September 2015, setting out the memory of the, Brit, of the German the Jews who had suffered at the hands of Hitler. He was prepared to commemorate that and lay a wreath. And when he stepped on Jamaican soil, 
he told us that we should walk away and forget what they have done to us. I remember also that a building, and this is very, very interesting, now called the Horizon Remand Center, was years ago, Things Jamaica, where young people were learning crafts, their craft and, and, and building their skills. And ironically, it is now a place to keep young men who are charged for crimes. We need reparation for enslavement. And we don't want to start the list of to-dos by the British with any prison. The to-dos is for a health system. The to-dos is for our schools. We should be building schools, not new prisons. It's a very difficult topic for me to deal with because I know the poor condition of our prisons. But I also happen to know our history. May it please you, thank you. I just want to say that this matter became enmeshed in the narrative of reparations for slavery, which were very much alive at the time of the visit. And I share the strong feelings about reparations. But what I don't understand is how we can be so angry and so irate about these injustices that took place hundreds of centuries ago and up to independence. But we're willing to live with the injustices and inhumane treatment and degradation that we as a sovereign nation are imposing on those 3,700 young men in our prisons today, mostly young men, a couple of hundred women, but mostly young men in our prisons today. Where is that outrage that we are willing to direct at David Cameron, who I completely agree with you was insensitive and, you know, his behavior to my mind was unacceptable. However, that does not forgive us. That does not take away our responsibility now as a sovereign nation for 55 years to deal with these human rights, you know, violations of our, our own citizens, our own Jamaican young men. This, the second point I want to, you, you spoke about some having, the British having some preference. They would, we, our, the main beneficiaries of the new prison would be those 1,500 or so Jama young Jamaicans who are in Tower Street and St. Catherine District right now. The, the maximum that it could have been at the point at which the negotiations were, and it was not a prisoner transfer agreement. Yes, we would have had to have had one if we were able to come to some mutually acceptable agreement, but what we had was a non-binding memorandum of understanding. But where we were in those negotiations was that it would have been a maximum of 300 out of the 2,000 that could have been used by Jamaicans being deported. The, the other thing is that in reality, when we looked at, for example, Nigeria, which had a similar amount of prisoners in UK prisons and who had signed a, UK, uh, a prisoner transfer agreement with the UK, after two years they had transferred exactly one Nigerian and only 16 were in, in process. So it was not like you were going to have a floodgate of persons flooding Jamaica. In fact, it was a small fraction relative to who are coming every month anyway. Um, even though there, it's, it's a combination of persons who, have, who are criminal deportees or immigra immigration violation type deportees. So I just wanted to, to, to clarify those two points, of, those few points before we get into the question and answer. Do we have, Ms. MP, MP Bunting, do we have room for, to negotiate the offer? I wanted to know whether the government in fact has any room because I, Professor Headley speaks about repurposing. So when the students... Absolutely. Until you sign an agreement, you, you are always in a negotiation. So we, when, when we came to office, the, a prisoner transfer agreement had been under discussion from 2007, I believe. Um, and it was the first time that money had actually now been put on the table. So we had brought them from zero to 30 million pounds grant. And there's nothing to say that, you know, that was the end of the negotiation. Uh, one of the things we, we want to make very clear is that we would not have a net financial cost. Um, in other words, if they wanted to transfer persons, which um, the numbers would make it that over time, we would end up 
transferring not just um, the, the, the humans, but the, we would end up, if it would end up costing us more than the 30 million or the 25 million pounds over, albeit over 10 or whatever amount of years, then that would also put a cap on, on, on how many people could be transferred based on the length of time they had left in their sentences. Hi. What are the implications of rejecting the offer made by the UK as it relates to international relationship between both countries? You know, I, I don't think it is going to, to affect the long-term diplomatic relations of, of, of Jamaica and the UK. They've been one of our, um, you know, strongest international partners, certainly in the area of law enforcement and national security. Uh, for some time, and I don't think this is going to be a, a, a break, a, you know, cause a breakdown, a major breakdown of, of the relationship. My name is George Young, and I'm with Stand Up for Jamaica. I'd just like to make two comments. One, we're talking about the inhumane condition inside of these correctional facilities, but this inhumane condition starts from the JCF lockup, where the exact condition as in the correctional facilities exist. Overcrowdedness, persons and women with slap buckets for up to three years not being found guilty. And if you have found get not guilty, you exit, but you have actually experienced the inhumane condition that we're talking about inside the correctional facilities that is being passed off that would have hardened young men into rockstone criminals. It starts from the lockup. I would have liked to pose this comment to the junior minister, but he had left. I noticed on his slides there were a lot of being certified by heart, skills, so forth. Having academic qualification doesn't necessarily translate into rehabilitation. And what is it I would have liked to see is more behavior modification programs. Someone was committed rape. I am inside there. How do I deal with rejection when I go back out? I have seen inmates who have leave these facilities come to my office. They say, look, I am prepared to go back. Not because they are hardened criminals, but because of one, the rejection by the society. Two, Prison for them is a safety net. So I would love to see something specifically behavior modification, psychological assistance for persons who are inside there. One young man said to me that he's afraid to go back outside. And the reason for that is the crime that he has committed. He killed a juvenile. But he has multiple personalities. And that is not being addressed in a holistic manner while he's inside here. Thank you. you want any I don't think that needs a response. <clears throat> George is absolutely correct. The, the, the conditions of the, of the lockups are, in fact, sometimes worse than, than the, the, the prisons. The, the overcrowding there is even more extreme. And um, the truth of the matter is it requires an investment in these facilities. And, you know, as I said, we can get as outraged as we want about reparations, but we have responsibility for ourselves now. And until we stop spending $800 million to Bush, the road bank, and spend that to upgrade the, the lockups and, and the correctional facilities, then, you know, we, we'll, we'll be in this discussion for years to come. Mr. Bunting, the outrage that we have is, in, is against the British. I hope you clearly understand that. It's not against the Jamaican government or the Jamaican people. The outrage we have is against the British. That's where we're directing it. And in the, we, are, we need to deal with the root causes of the problems we have. The educational system needs injection because, as I said, we started with 100% illiteracy. And therefore, if we are not articulating this to the British and have them come to the table and negotiate with us, we are starting at the, at the other end of the, of, of the problem, which is the, is the end of the, 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 the crime chain, as you could call it that. That's my view. 
But birds. Yes. Shouldn't some of the outrage be directed at ourselves? Because we have a class race division in our society. And that is at the root of, of the problem, essentially. Okay, that's true. They had one in Rwanda. We should find out how that started. But anyway, it's, you know, it's going to be a difficult problem. Um, yes, uh, Susan Goff. I'm with JFJ, but wearing my own hat at the moment. One of the things that I think that we have to deal with in regard to the whole approach to the prisons is the attitude that we continue to have. George, I think, mentioned it, the stigma, where we feel okay to th refer to and think of people in prison as dirty criminals, and that we have an approach that says, lock them up, throw away the key, write them off. And it came out in the discussions about the prison deal and the reactions where people kept saying they are, you know, they're the low down on our list of priorities. But again, what we have to keep remembering is even from a pragmatic point of view, connect the dots, the majority of the people in prison come back out, as people have said. The majority of pri people in prison have families outside. Some of them have children who are affected by their absence, can't get to visit them from one end of the year to the next or get a five minute visit. How are we maintaining those family connections? How are we viewing people who are in prison as citizens of Jamaica entitled to be, be treated in a particular way, dignity, and a word that I think it was Mr. Bunting said, we need to invest in these facilities, we need to invest in the people in these facilities, because if we don't do that, when they come back out, from a pragmatic point of view, the, they continue to cause problems for the society, for their communities, Families are broken apart, and we can't move forward. But it means that we have to stop thinking of people and feeling comfortable in referring to people as dirty criminal. We have to keep remembering that our brothers and sisters may have committed, some of them, horrendous crimes, but they remain Jamaican citizens, they remain our fellow citizens, and we have to do what is best for them in the context of the society. Can I make a comment to Suzanne? I think you hit some very, very vital uh, points. Um, one of them is the fact that there is no sympathy at all towards who is committing crime due to the fact that we live in a violent society. Therefore, if somebody breaks the law, take him away. I don't want to hear anything from him. He's a blind corner. Because the, it's a minority, the amount of people which are detained for 45 years. As it was said before, the majority are between six months and three, four, five years, which means it's a term. And after that term, you go back where you're coming from. So you cannot say, throw, throw away the key, because the, throw away key, the key does not reach too far. Because once they go back, you have missed the biggest chance that you have to avoid for them to repeat what they did before. It's a chance. That's why I call it building time. Right? It's a building time. You have three years, two years, nine months. Let's use this time to avoid to see something else. And let's use that time also, as George was mentioning before, to, to build up a, a person. Because a lot of them, we deal with them regularly. A lot of them, they cannot read, they cannot write, they have no idea what does it mean to apply for parole. They cannot read the prescription of the doctor and so on. So that time should be, should be used from the inside to, to, to work on them. But if the outside keep having such a form of refuse, no interest and statement like I don't care, it is one of the biggest idiot things that people can do outside. Uh, MP Bunting, would you say that your, your, your party's 
priorities on incarceration as opposed to what the minister says, the government is interested in prevention and diversion. So he's not interested in building prisons, but he's interested in emphasizing or focusing on prevention and diversion. So if you accept the deal, is it an indication that the focus is on incarceration? We, as I said, we, during, in, in four short years, we were able to reduce the, the prison population by 15%, and that was precisely because of, of diversion programs. And it should, the momentum should be even greater because of the decriminalization of small quantities of ganja, which we passed, which we, we also thought was an important piece of social engineering. And one of the benefits of that would be to reduce um, overcrowding in lockups and in prisons and in, in the court system. I, I, I would find it difficult to go back to, to any administration and don't find the right words being spoken about in terms of what needs to be done. But at the end of the day, it's, it's the action <laughs> that's going to make the difference. You know, we have to get a system where the weakest prisoners feel safe, where all prisoners are treated with respect, where all prisoners are busily occupied, expected to improve themselves, and given the opportunity to do so. And one in which all prisoners, as you said, can strengthen links with their families. Because the truth of the matter is, the, as much as we look on the offender as, as being punished, the truth of the matter is their children are being punished, their, their wives or um, partners are being punished. The, you know, it, it's a, it's, it's a, it has a much wider impact beyond that individual. And until we start taking that holistic approach to, to addressing the, the problem, we just keep getting what we're getting. And we're having a revolving door. Some people have called um, GP and, and St. Catherine crime factories, yeah. you know, because we're taking in young men who are not serious criminals. And by the time we cycle them through a couple of times, so they come out as... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, the very last question. Yeah. Um, good evening. I'm Damian. Uh, I, I want to look on the fact that um, we're a majority black nation. Most of those people are black. And uh, you also spoke about us being humane to our the prisoners. And I think you... No, I said... <laughs> I said the conditions are inhumane. Yeah. That's oh, sorry, sorry. Essentially okay. being humane. <laughs> yeah. Because the conditions are inhumane. If right. we fix those conditions, we'll be humane to them. So I'm saying that I'd agree that we should be extend this humanity to the nation itself. And I'm saying that it's, a, it's Jamaica, but there is a particular disadvantage to being black in this black country. And I'm saying, I'm asking you specifically today, what will you do or what or do you think it is fair to start to pay not those people who are in prison now but people the people working in these um, especially franchises these multinationals with high productivity rates who are being paid low and disincentivized to continue to do that kind of work do you think we should pay these people a living wage a humane wage to help to discourage them from engaging in activities which may, which, which may li make their lives worse and our lives worse, so, just so we won't be here two years, three years, five years, 10 years having these discussions. Is it not now time to get people out of poverty by paying them what they work for? <laughs> the, it, well, if I was to answer it simply, I would say yes. You know, everybody deserves a, a living wage. Um, the, but it's, you know, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, part of our challenge is that, you know, we, we're not generating enough high paying or good paying jobs, which is why we have a high, level, high levels of unemployment and which is why when a, a business process outsourcing call center or, or somebody that, you know, can take a lot of people, put them through a uh, you know, a high intensity experience and pay them what is, is seen as relatively low wages, um, you know, people get frustrated. In fact, I recall as minister having a, a forum 
similar to this in, in, in Montego Bay. And we had students, we had um, professionals, you know, we had police officers, teachers. And at, at question and answer time, somebody raised their hand and everybody was introducing themselves before they asked the question. And he said, I'm a person of interest to the police. That's how, <laughs> that's how he introduced himself. And so I was very curious in the break, I went over to <laughs> and engaged him. And he explained, he, he admitted that he was a scammer and he was involved, actively involved in scamming. And he said, well, but really I learned the trade working in the call centers. I worked in a call center. He says, I worked in a call center that I used to do outbound telemarketing and they, you know, they taught me how to gain people's confidence, you know, gain their trust, how to handle objections, all the, the marketing thing. And he said, but after two years working there, I was only in earning enough to keep coming back to work. Because by the time I paid my rent, um, paid my transportation and, and bought food, that was it. So I just, there was just enough to keep me coming back to work, but I wasn't making any progress. And he said that, and you know, he, he confessed, he says, you know, I, I know it's wrong. He said, I know it's wrong, but I'm making so much money um, now doing this that I want to just do it for, um, for a period of time and stop. No, the irony is that he then closed by saying, you know, I, I want to go into farming and I bought a piece of land and I asked, and my father knows about farming and I put him on the land and thing. He says, but minister, the prayer last night is killing me. <laughs> this is a true story. This is a real story, you know? So, you know, it's a kind of a long answer, but it tells you some of the, it, it shows some of the complexities. Um, but generally speaking, in, in, in short, if we had more jobs that offered a living wage, um, you know, we'd obviously have a lot less candidates with time, time on their hands to get into illicit activity. Well, I can't resist this minister, I mean, ex-minister. Yourself and Mr. Charles, under the pressure from a bigger country, cause the scamming legislation to be passed. And hear what happens. A man who takes a knife and robs an old Jamaican woman coming out of the bank can only get three years in the parish court because of the pressure that came under our government when you scam an old lady with a phone, no violence, 15 years, your parliament imposed. And that's directly well, connected now, before you speak, it's directly connected now to the prison population. Look uh, at it. Can I it's tell so you much something? out of line, it's can so I ridiculous. Tell you Although that is on the books, I challenge you to show me one scammer who has got yes, a, a, the court a term of appeal, more than five the, years. The Court of Appeal has recently said the imposition of a sentence by a high court judge of 10 years was out of line for the same reason. If you scam so, 15 years, if you take a Jamaican old woman and take a knife and take her money from her on the streets, three years. It is because we were under pressure from another place to make this a strong well, perhaps, sentence. Perhaps, Remember I tell you Perhaps what. the three years is too low. The, the truth of the matter is the, the, these were upper limits um, <laughs> and there are no mandatory minimum. And the reality is, the reality is, 90% yes. of convictions for scamming related offenses are non custodial. 90%. I, okay. I struggle to point to custodial sentences, first offender. Okay, I'll check scamming. that out. All right. so it's it not means my experience. With all this discussion, it means we need to have other seminars. So <laughs> we shall invite you to others. <laughs>